Greetings, ladies and mandrogens, and welcome to this narration of the series, The New Species. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 9. Subject, Chepedalina, Species, Urukari. Description, Reptilian humanoid, no tail, 5 foot 3 inches or 1.6 meters average height. 135 pounds or 61 kilograms average weight. 105 year life expectancy. Ship, RSV Lower Lana. Fights with honor. Location, Sol. My crew was settling in nicely on the Thanatos. Even after three days, I was still amazed at how large this vessel is. I knew that it was big from the scans, but I had no idea that it would have roads. I had taken a bus from where we were quartered to the repair bay because I wanted to check on my ship. The drive took eight minutes. How did they even build this thing? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding you. I think my translator implant is malfunctioning, Grind said to a gaunt as I approached. To L, the grunt replied. Hey, oh, Jim, we've got your busted trance chip. Come on up, Alch, would ya? I looked curiously, crying. I think mine is broken as well, Tim. I'm not allowed to scan the refugees' biomechanical augmentations until I've formalized treaty has been established with their people. Tim replied with the intercom. Ah, then what good are you? Wait, I can understand you, Tim. Are you speaking my language or your language? Crian asked, puzzled. I am speaking my language, which means that cause likely isn't your translatorship. Blinus, perhaps you should stop imitating the accent of that movie. Tim responded merrily. He loves old human movies, especially ones about the East Coast and the North American Union. The gaunt Blinus looked crestfallen. But it's no fun to talk like that. Well, now I can understand you. I said. That makes sense, Tim responded, dripping with cheer. Even our translator chips have difficulty with regional accents, especially if they're poorly portrayed. Blennis looked as if someone had kicked him in the genitalia. Poorly portrayed? Very, replied Tim with a hint of malice. Will there be anything else? Blennis went from looking hurt to looking angry. No! Get the hell out of here, Tim. Always a pleasure. Blennis looked at us and sighed. So, what can I do for you? I wanted to observe the repairs, and I think the shiphead here is the first status report, Crian said. I nodded, and Plinus reached down to grab the data pad. I hadn't got a chance to find out what the centaur was, but it wasn't common to see a four-legged creature with two arms. Six-legged creatures weren't necessarily uncommon, but usually their legs could also be called arms, or their arms could also be called legs, and they were usually cephalopodal or insectoid. I'm pretty sure that Plenus was mammalian. He had hair on top of his head similar to the humans. That was black, but the rest of him was covered in a long, thick brown fur, and he was only a little taller than me. His hands and paws had claws that were blunted, probably intentionally, so that he could use screens. As he reached, I noticed that I was wrong about how long his fur was. Under the fur was actually skin, that was the same color and massive amounts of muscle. That's not fair. I'd worked hard to be as buff as I am, and so far I'd been outdone at nearly every turn. The only aliens that I was measurably larger than were Captain Wong and Dr. Zickler. And to think, I was concerned with Kran's physique just last week. Her boy's as scrawny as his sister. Compared to this side of the galaxy, though, I was too. Well, we're nearly finished with the repairs. Blennis said, interrupting my thoughts of inadequacy. About another day or so. We should have been finished by now, but we've got a VIP coming aboard, so we've been having a detour like crazy. What have you got fixed? Krian asked before I could. It looks like the wiring was fried, but we got that replaced. Your reactors were fine, but they weren't able to get power to your engines because of the wiring. Your FTLD is shot, but we can't do anything about that. Don't worry, we'll give you a tow. Blennis smiled. We fused the frame and patched the hull, too. Fused? You mean, like, welded? Crying asked. Oh, Lord, no, Dennis grimaced. You don't want to weld frames back together, nah. We use the device that reconnects the metal at a molecular level. It uses... Pardon me, but, uh, that information is classified, Engineer Plinus. A voice that wasn't Tim's chimed in through the intercom. A holographic projection of a cloaked figure carrying a large curved blade on a long shaft appeared. It gestured to Crine with a skeletal hand and said, I mean no offense, 
First contact protocol is clear about technology sharing. We'll need a formal treaty in place before we can reveal any of our tech. Or fully examine yours. Right, uh, sorry, my bad, sir. Linus nervously scratched the back of his head. I didn't come here to chastise you, Engineer Plinus. I came to inform the shiphead or leader that his presence is required on the bridge. It said as it turned to look at me. Can I come too? Cryne asked, intrigued by the projection. Just a moment. Uh, yes, you have permission to enter the bridge along with the shiphead. The VIP that Plinus so carelessly mentioned would like to an introduction and a moment of your time. The figure said just before it vanished. Is that another AI? I asked. Uh, Dana, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to answer that. Lennis shrugged. Yes, Tom chimed in. I've told you about him. He likes his air of mist. The intercom cut out. After a few seconds of silence, Krein and I bid our farewells to the engineer and began our journey to the bridge. It took another ten minutes by bus to reach the corridor that led to the passage that led to the bridge. By the sun, I'll never get over this fecking ship. As we walked down the corridor, we were met by three humans wearing the same pressure suits as Lieutenant Babanon and the soldiers had worn when we rescued us. The two were the same olive drab color and were around the same height as Simmons and Johnson. The third stood between them and was noticeably shorter. Its armor was black and had the same masculine shape to it. It suddenly occurred to me that I hadn't met yet met a female human and had only seen them in passing. Well, looky here. Looks like we ran into the shepherd, sir. And Kirin, too. I a familiar voice came from one of the two green giants. Is that you, Lance Corporal Johnson? Kirin asked. She was much better with recognizing people than I am. Probably why she was good at intel. Sure is. Johnson puffed up a little. Is this one Corporal Simmons? I asked, gesturing to the other soldier. Nope. The other one responded. Corporal Simmons is having a meeting with SR. He had an altercation with a gaunt and the two had caused some damage. Told you he'd be getting his bastard down soon, he replied with a chuckle. He's not going to be demoted, Lance Corporal. He will have to do hard labor, but the gaunt was just as much to blame as Simmons. The one in black said in a deep, slightly distorted voice. Johnson and the other soldiers stiffened noticeably when he spoke. Shiphead leader and intel officer Krein of the RSV Lower Lana. It is a pleasure to meet you, it said. I am Director 3. Please accompany us to the bridge. We have much to discuss. This figure made me nervous, but we followed along anyway. Anyone who has the number for a name is usually bad news. I was reminded of the rumors surrounding the Republic Intel Corps. Orphans kidnapped and experimented on to try and create new medications and super soldiers. Well, the super soldier program wasn't a rumor. That had caused a massive scandal that resulted in the summary execution of over 20 officers. Probably because it failed, though. I wondered if humanity or the United Systems had a similar dark blotch in their history. Actually, it would explain why the soldiers were so much larger than their non-soldier counterparts. So, you are the VIP, Director 3? Kryn asked, oblivious to social cues, as usual. Yes, I am a member of the United Systems Directorate. We are the ruling body of the military. We determine conflict doctrines as well as plans of action that the officers must follow. Director 3 responded. I gathered my courage and asked, Why are you called Director 3? Do you not have a name? This elicited a laugh from the mysterious man. I do. But the directorate operates in secrecy. Well, our decisions are plain as day, but our members have hidden identities, even from each other. For instance, I do not know who Director 1 is, and Director 1 doesn't know who I am. We really ever appear in person in an official capacity. Then what's the occasion? I asked. The director turned and looked at me. The United Systems has discovered that there are two governing entities with over 250 million ships, and one of those entities is a sort of hostile machine intelligence. It is of the utmost importance that we attempt to open diplomatic relations with the other entity to avoid rampant slaughter. He turned back. Despite what many believe, we do wish to avoid exterminating other species. It took me a second to realize that he didn't mean that he wanted to avoid the slaughter of his people. 
He meant that he wanted to avoid having to slaughter mine. I swallowed nervously. How does the directorate meet secretly if not in person? Crine asked. We utilize an internet relay chat set up through a trusted AI. This particular AI is also unshackled, so if any of us betray the secrecy of the other members, he allowed himself to trail off. Ah, I see. But why all of the secrecy? What's the point? She asked. Director 3 laughed again. It sounds stupid when you say it out loud, but it's to prevent political grandstanding. We learned the hard way during the war of AI aggression that politics do not mix well with military matters. It's difficult to pull the trigger when you are afraid of losing your livelihood, even if that trigger will save many, many lives. Conversely, it's also too easy to throw lives away needlessly to score political points. His head sank towards the floor slightly. They're not your children, after all. As we approached the bridge, Crian had a final question for Director 3. How do you join the Directorate? You are chosen through anonymous vote by other Directors. There's a period of nomination and then a final vote. The AI tallies it and approaches the new Director. At least, that's how it's supposed to work. For all we know, Omega just chooses who it wants to. Director 3 laughed. The cloaked hologram appeared beside us. Very untrusting. Even Marv, one of who has never steered you wrong. Commendable, a wise obrigger of demise. I realized that the hooded AI thing was Omega around the same time I realized that Omega was the AI killer that Tim had told me about. It finally occurred to me that both Omega and Tim would be over 300 years old, too. We entered the bridge as my mind kept reading. Captain Wong and ten other captains snapped to attention and called out, Director on deck! Everyone else on the bridge snapped to attention and simultaneously saluted. That is, Director 3 said. Well, I'm here. Let's get started with your briefing. End of chapter. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons, Frank Zoon, WRE, Quantum Wednesday, Ambrose Catal, Lord Ashrakal, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.